Uh, is that all right with everybody? <laughs> um, so the infectious disease section, I just think is not very well laid out for rounds. Like I think I'd have to give you like 10 chapters to cover to kind of be able to have an interesting discussion. So I'm going to sort of say we, we might just skip over the rest of the infectious disease section. So for the next fortnight, we'll move on to the next section. But what I did want to sort of talk about today is mainly a more clinical approach to infectious disease. So um, like cases where, um, you know, a cat comes in with upper respiratory um, discharge, nasal discharge and things like like that, if that's all right, and keep it pretty casual. And I haven't got a PowerPoint or anything like that for this one. And then in the last half of today, I wanted to give anyone that has done exams a chance to ask me any questions that they had about their exams that they were confused about or anything like that. Um, and you can test me if you want. I can't believe I've just put myself on the spot like that. <laughs> um, so has anybody done any reading for today's session, just out of interest? Yes. Have you? Jeff, what did you I read? Have. <laughs> well done. What have you read about? Uh, well, bronchial diseases in Ettinger. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, upper airway, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I thought was the, was the thing. But as you said, they're mostly infectious. Yes. So we're up to, I mean, we're up to the infectious section in Edinger, but I feel like infectious diseases are always differentials in a clinical presentation rather than the infection. It's, the infection itself is kind of the end. Um, so, yes, I've kind of mixed in the respiratory section and the infectious section for today. Um, so there's definitely a couple of diseases that happen quite commonly that I think we should probably cover. Um, with respiratory tract infections. Um, let me just grab my notes. So if we just kind of work through a bit of a case. So I've got a three-year-old cat with a gradually progressive increase in stertor while sleeping. Um, who, sorry, doing two things at once, um, who has now a, developed an acute onset of green nasal discharge that is only present from the left nostril and the right nostril is clear. Can somebody tell me what their first approach to this cat would be? Basic screening first, bloods and urine. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, that may or may not show anything. But uh, with nasal problems, uh, which may, be, may not be the primary thing, but um, I wouldn't waste time on x-rays anymore. I'd go straight to CT. That's definitely my experience too. We see so many x-rays that I just can't interpret at all yeah well, you know, i mean you know that it's not in there you're going to see an increase in soft tissue density in that side it's very hard to interpret um so what are your differentials for a unilateral nasal discharge in a cat of this age group what, what age had again sorry three, three. yeah three. maybe a pollock good um foreign body Good. Mm. Yeah, crypto. Good. Lymphoma, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. And just viral infection as well. Good. Yeah. There's some gardening here, so that's why I'm muted most of the time. Sorry, it's quite loud. Oh, <laughs> I actually can't hear it at all. So is there any other, so we covered viral, um, anything, any other 
infectious diseases we should cover? We covered cryptococcosis. Okay, aspergillosis. Good, Matt. Excellent. Particularly sort of unilateral like that. It should definitely be on the list. Good. Um, so your we've done screening gloves, we've done urine, um, and there's a mild inflammatory lithogram, and that's it. And Jeff sort of mentioned he wants to do a CT. Are there any other blood tests you want to do before we do the CT? No, LCAT. Good. Excellent. LCAT is negative. Um, so we do our CT scan. And while we're anesthetizing this cat, he does a big sneeze and a blade of grass comes out his nose, <laughs> which happens all the time. <laughs> and it's very rewarding. Oh, and the other thing that happened quite recently at Nev's was a cat came in with a leech up its nose. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it came in with epistaxis and it was a leech. Oh, we had that a couple of months ago too. It's amazing. I guess because of the wet weather, they're all coming out, but oh. <laughs> Saw this, all we could see was the green stripe and we thought it was a foreign body, but the green stripe was the stripe of the leech. Oh, wow. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> that is horrible. <laughs> yeah. What nightmares are made of. <laughs> How did you get it out? It was, um, it was pulled out. I think we had to sedate the cat and then it was pulled out. Yeah, it didn't. It wasn't difficult actually to get out. Yeah, it's good. One of the vet who saw this um, has a leech. <laughs> she made the nurse do it, and the nurse was like, "This is the best thing I've ever done." <laughs> Quite good. Um, okay, so pretend it wasn't a blade of grass because that's boring. Um, so CT shows a soft tissue mass in the um, right caudal nasal cavity causing obstruction and increased in soft tissue um, mucus essentially um, in the more cranial nasal cavity. Um, what is the next um, diagnostic test we want to do? Rhinos rhinoscopy. Yeah. And my retro pharyngoscopy to have a look at the back of the nose. Yep. That's ideal. Is there anything else you can do if you don't have a rhinoscopy? The nasal flush. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk through the procedure? Because I know I've made you do it a million times. The nasal flush. Yeah. Um, yeah, you just pack the, um, the pharynx with, with swabs and just making sure you know how many swabs you're packing in there and how many mils they're capable of holding. And then... Um, uh, if, from rostral to caudal, you, you flush with a syringe with however many mils you packed with the swabs. Um, um, and sometimes you need to kind of put like a small catheter on the end to try and get into a smaller opening, in, especially in cats, to flush through the saline um, back into the swabs. And then you kind of check the swabs and see what specimens you've got. <laughs> uh, the specimens is a bit of an intake. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So quite often, particularly with polypoid soft tissue mass masses that are causing obstruction in a cat, if you can create enough pressure rostrally to caudally, you can actually flush out chunks of lymphoma and polyps, which is both therapeutic because you're getting rid of all the mucus and some of that obstructive pathology, and you're also getting a really effective histo sample. Um, often causes a little bit of bleeding, but it's nowhere near as much bleeding as if you do a traumatic biopsy with like a grabber or something like that. So I'm a huge fan of a nasal flush, both therapeutically and um, for sample acquisition. And it's something you can do in general practice really well. The other thing that's quite nice to do is pass a catheter past it. And if you can use a sort of dental mirror to look up over the soft palate and see a catheter coming through, demonstrate patency of that nostril is another nice thing to do. And flushing as you go will help to sort of clear the nasal passage as well. So same way you pass like a nasogastric tube sort of thing. Um, so good. So our histopathology comes back as lymphoma. 
Um, what further testing would you like to do in this cat? FIV, FELV, neurology, and immunocytochemistry. Good. Excellent. Immunocytochemistry. Yeah, immunohistochemistry, you know, you know, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. On the, on the histo. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Um, so, sorry, I deviated from infectious diseases. I intended to make that not, <laughs> not lymphoma, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so going back to our CT, same cat, same um, signal motion, everything. Um, uh, unilateral dis nasal discharge from the left nostril, um, but on CT, we've got a uh, destructive rhinosinusitis that is just starting to extend into the right side of the nasal cavity as well with extensive loss of turbinate detail. I could probably even show you a CT if you want me to. Does anyone on the, on the basis of that description have any suspicions straight off? Yeah, either fungal or neoplastic. Good, yeah. Aggressive. Yeah. Aggressive, yes. Um, so particularly that osteolithic, sorry, my PowerPoint's not cool, not um, playing very well. Did we do a practice exam for um, an aspergillus case? I don't think we did, did we? Okay, just want to show you because people that um, haven't seen much CT can really change that angle and it really helps you kind of if you see some a um, uh, if you see a case presenting it really helps you understand sort of what's going on inside the nose. Coming, coming, sorry. There we go. <clears throat> um, so you can see in this one, the change between sides of the nose. So on this side of the nose, which is probably the left, if it's properly positioned, you can see all of the little bony turbinate details. And this is one of the reasons why we always recommend CT in a in um, dog and cat noses because there's just so much detail in this nose that you're always going to be really hard to pick up a foreign body or anything unless it's really dense on a radiograph. And you can see on this side, there's a complete loss of those turbinates. So all those little fine bones have just essentially been eaten away. So very osteolytic pattern and destructive rhinitis. And then if we were to scroll through this, we usually see that the Sinus was full of um, that soft tissue stuff as well. And you can almost imagine the fluffy edge on there, which is probably fungal, you know, like the moldy bread. Um, so that, that sort of fluff. Is that right with everybody? Do you want to keep looking at it a little bit longer or I'll get rid of it? <laughs> so that's what we see on our CT. What's our leading differential? Uh, like, I, like as Jeff said, aspergillosis or neoplasia. Yeah, excellent. So I think neoplasia is pretty unlikely. And obviously you'd wait for a CT report to see whether there was contrast enhancement and stuff like that. Um, but neoplasia typically forms masses. And when you've got really diffuse changes like this, um, it's unlikely to be a mass. There's something else in cats that can cause um, really sort of profound destructive rhinitis. There are parasites that can do that. Um, sorry, uh, I heard Jeff. A parasite? Um, I can't think. I can't think of one actually. There's, there's, there's a name comes through my head called ling, lingua tula serrata, but I, I don't know whether the two are connected or not. I have to say that's not ringing any bells for me, which is a bit scary. <laughs> I've definitely failed that test. 
Don't worry, it might have been me that's wrong. <laughs> we'll Google that one. Um, Max, what did you say? Oh, just thinking like any sort of uh, allergic, like eosinophilic rhinitis, can they be like destructive? Yeah. So the destruction is due to very profound chronic inflammation. So fungal infections are really good at causing inflammation and that's why they are so likely to cause a destructive rhinitis. So in cats, excuse me, <coughs> um, certainly an allergic rhinitis could cause that, would most likely be bilateral. Um, but we also see chronic viral, these chronic snufflers have often got a destructive rhinitis as well. So cats that have chronic nasal discharge, chronic high levels of inflammation in their nose, particularly with um, frequent secondary bacterial infections. Um, so that's another differential, not for this patient with a unilateral change, but um, for patients with a bilateral change. So say our leading differential is aspergillus in a cat. Can you tell me about aspergillus in cats? Is that common? Nope. I think I've got some head shakes there. Not, not as common as dogs. Good. Excellent. Um, and how does it behave differently in cats than it does in dogs typically? Do you know? No? I don't. Sorry. No, it's really, it's really interesting. There's two forms in cats. There's cyanonasal, same as they get in dogs, which does tend to be a localised disease. Um, the prognosis is still not not good actually. Um, cats tend to be better at forming kind of granulomas and things around their aspergillus. Um, and they respond really poorly to, to, um, to um, trephination and treatment. So we tend to treat them with systemic antifungals. But then there's a second form of it called sinoorbital aspergillosis, which is really severe, really um, aggressive. Do you remember a cat that had exophthalmus? Um, I'm just trying to remember his name. Black cat, lovely, hated needles. Um, oh, I can't remember the name. Um, anyway, he had sinoorbital aspergillosis. And, yeah, the prognosis is months um, on quite aggressive um, antifungal, so things like posaconazole. Um, with the with uh, um, all the other azoles essentially, uh, and terbinafine as well, and yeah, they go really poorly. So it's much worse prognosis in cats than dogs because it tends to be more systemic; it get invades more. Have you ever seen it, Max? Uh, I've only seen one. Uh, it's a sonal uh, orbital, and okay. yeah, we did treat it systemically. Yeah. How did it go? Do you remember? It died very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think they, they tend to, and it just is such a painful condition because it causes exothalmus and it's so poorly responsive to the antifungals. It's very frustrating. Um, it just... <clears throat> oh, hang on, you muted, Jeff. Just to backtrack a bit, that lingua chula serrata is a parasite of dogs and humans. Okay. Um, and it's a pentastomid, which is sort of a little bit more arthropod than worm, uh, and occurs in Europe and North Africa. All oh, right, and it goes in the nose. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So. Um, um, yeah, you haven't got much more on it yet. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Um, thankfully not, not present here. <laughs> um, so say we sort of backtrack again and we've got the same patient and our CT changes were actually bilateral and more consistent with chronic inflammation in both sides of the nose. Um, let's talk about viral diseases that cause rhinitis in cats is where I'm going to with this. What are they? 
Khaleesi and herpes virus. Good. Excellent. Um, so what's, what other symptoms might be present concurrently with the rhinitis? Ocular disease. Yep. Um, with herpes or like oral lesions with Khaleesi. Excellent. Good. What sort of oral lesions might you see? Like ulcers in the roof of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And tongue too sometimes, forces. They like being at the back there. Um, what eye lesions might you see? Ulcers in the eye, on the cornea. Good. Yep. Um, Plethora spasm, chemosis. Good. Excellent. Um, good. Uh, the other one, Lisa, the other um, symptom I've got here is actually facial dermatitis, but I'm not sure I've ever actually seen that. I guess it might be because they've got congestion and rubbing their face as well. Um, so if we did see that, a really severely um, affected cat with a lot of upper respiratory inflammation, what sort of treatment options are we going to be offering? In like a, a viral cat? Yeah, well, assume, okay, let's go back. What, what further diagnostics could we do to clarify whether it's a viral, bacterial or um, sort of, yeah, clarify this further? We've got diffuse inflammation. It's symmetrical, bilateral, and it's chronic. Um, what other tests should we do? It's quite too tricky. I mean, it's a similar test to what we have already said. So if we, if we wanted to be really thorough, we could do imaging again and FIV, FLB testing. But I think to try and diagnose viral infection is quite tricky because so many cats carry it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you could do like PCR, but... It's difficult to interpret a positive and any kind of cultures if you're looking for bacterial infections and, um, you know, again, can be just um, commensal organisms. So it can be quite tricky to rule that out as well as a bacterial cause. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah. So I think both culture and PCR are fraught with false positives. But I think in this context where we're seeing a lot of inflammation and we're tying that in with a positive PCR for herpes virus, for example. I think that's probably significant. Um, and it would potentially make me treat for viral disease as opposed to treating for bacterial disease, or maybe even treat for both. But um, I think a PCR would be potentially warranted in this patient. What treatment options are there? Like anti um, viral medication, fem femcyclovir. Good, excellent. And um, if there's a bacterial component, um, an antibiotic. Yep, good. And how are you going to determine if there's a bacterial component? I don't really know. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of hard. I think suspicion, clinical suspicion. Yeah. So what I'd, what I'd probably do is do a direct um, cytology of the nasal discharge. And if I've got heaps of inflammatory cells with intracellular bacteria in them, then I would probably say there's probably an overgrowth of bacteria here. Um, I know that typically antimicrobial usage should be based on the um, culture and sensitivity results, but we're not going to do that in this patient. What would be your first choice of a... Um, what's the word when you choose an antibiotic? Spherical? Yes. Antibiotic? Yeah, that's the one. What's your first choice? I, I want to say doxycycline, but um, I know you're going to ask me why. So <laughs> I think it's more just because it's the right spectrum for um, Bordetella, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how much cats are affected by Bordetella. I think it's more mm -hmm. a dog thing. So yeah. I, put it on there. Um, so I would choose doxycycline as well. And the main reason is because it works and where would you? just we don't really understand why um so it's got a good spectrum for like to i think as well like a lot of the oropharyngeal commensals 
So it just decreases the bacterial load in general, which is going to decrease the reactivity of the, um, the immune, local immune system. Uh, when you've got so much inflammation there from the viruses, then there's going to be more opportunities for infections to form. So you, having decreased commensals, I guess, just decreases that risk. Um, but the other nice thing about doxycycline is that it gets in there. Like it's an air-filled space. Most antibiotics don't penetrate very well. Like they don't get up to, <clears throat> sorry, the MIC in both upper and lower airway. So you have to select your antibiotic based on the, the fact that it gets where it needs to go at the right concentration. And doxycycline is a really good choice for that. Um, all right. Are there any other treatment options which might decrease risk of recurrence if we used chronically? Is that like like L lysine that kind of thing? I, is that is that I heard that was not really recommended anymore, but um, for a while. So theoretical benefits um, in that in in vitro it decreases herpes viral replication, but in vivo in shelter populations, it actually hasn't been demonstrated to help. Um, I, anecdotal, I shouldn't say this. I usually give it. Um, I think a lot of, particularly when it's been really chronic like that, a lot of clients are quite sort of proactive and happy to be doing something. Um, the other thing that's, um, sort of coming out in humans more and more is that if you give probiotics in patients with both upper respiratory tract disease and chronic bronchitis, you change the oropharyngeal commensal population to a less, less pathogenic sort of strain and it decreases the local mucosal reactivity because they're less kind of um, irritant bacteria. This is in humans, there's no evidence at all in, in animals. But again, if you've got super proactive clients, you're not going to do any harm putting them on probiotics, I guess. But um, that's new evidence in humans. Well, Was that about... a mixture of probiotics? Sorry, Brian? Is that a mixture of um, bacterial probiotics? Um, uh, the, I don't know what studies what the bacterial strain was that they used in humans, but it's probably not transferable to animals anyway um but yeah i guess it's just the i don't know the usual probiotics I, yeah and they with, with the um bam beard, do you use it long term for years and years because they can they get like a reduced arginine absorption and i don't know if that's a problem i'm not fan B, sorry lysine oh lysine um that's a really good question i don't know actually but you'd be happy, you've, on the odd case, you're happy to use it long term. Yeah, I have definitely used it long term. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, I might need to look that up though. That might be bad. Um, I actually don't see that many primary viral cats, <laughs> fortunately. What, what about inhalations and bisolvent to um, oh, um, li liquefy the. the um, Good point. So nebulization with saline in these cats has been shown to be very therapeutic if they will tolerate it. Because obviously if they've got a partial kind of upper respiratory obstruction and you're putting a mask over their face, um, it can sometimes exacerbate their respiratory distress. But nebulizing with saline decreases their congestion and symptoms for sure. Um, bisolvent, I have to say I haven't used in cats, but certainly in dogs for sure with um, LP rhinitis for sure. Some owners report that it's the big kind of game changer of all of the medications we prescribe. It's the cheapest and best. Um, do you use it in cats, Jeff? Hi, my you name can is John. Do. I know we haven't really spoken in a while. Uh, you, you can do. Um, I haven't used it much because I, uh, I haven't had the need, but in dogs a lot and myself. <laughs> Whenever I get a, an upper respiratory or sinus thing, and, and it makes your nose run like crazy. And, yeah. and also, of interest, is, uh, as an aside, I had a client once who was a nurse in a fertility clinic, human one, um, and they give it to men to increase their semen volume. Oh, really? Mm. 
Interesting. Noted. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. Are there any other infectious diseases we should talk about? Um, I just had a thought with the viral ones in terms of other long-term treatment management stuff was environmental factors like decreasing oh. stress if multi-cat households um, putting them into kennels if they're going away get the neighbors to come feed them kind of thing yeah so. very important for relapses absolutely that's really good um and potentially yeah if these cats need sort of hospitalization and and things i don't know if that's the time to do a lysine or something but yeah, absolutely, minimising stress. Uh, all right, should we move on to dogs? Because they're my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so same signalment, got a three-year-old. I kind of talked about most of the kind of aspergillus. Um, let's, okay. Same dog, same signalment, three-year-old dog, left-sided nasal discharge and increased stertor, decreased airflow through the left nostril on examination, otherwise systemically well um, and presents to you. Your routine bloods are normal, your urine is normal um, and the dog has some pain on palpation over the left side of the nose. What are you going to do next? Where does the dog live or where has he been in the last month? He lives in the northern beaches and he hasn't travelled widely. Good question, then. If he'd been to Canberra or the Riverina or uh, inland, well, it would be a grass seed. Um, certainly we do have some long grass here and we do see some grass seeds up here. Um, definitely foreign bodies on the list. Um, you've already sort of answered this question in cats, so I'm going to just say the LCAT came back positive. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, CT would be, I think, quite valuable. Mm-hmm. Good. Um, just to see if there's any or the extent of disease and where it's localised to, if it kind of matches up with that painful area. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, you could ideally try and get a sample to kind of back it up with the LCAT, but if you can't, then because of the CT, then I guess you could go off the LCAT mm-hmm. in treatment. Yep. And what would you do with your sample if you got one? I'd probably just... So I'd probably just do in-house cytology because that can be quite easy to, to diagnose. And if, you, if the lymph nodes are enlarged, I'd get a mm-hmm. FNA of those as well to kind of um, see if there's crypto in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, if you get a chunk, you could send it for like histo to get more, um, more confirmation. It's all about getting more confirmation, I guess. Do you want to send it for culture, Josh? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so there's a couple of different types of crypto and they have different sensitivities um, to antifungals. So it is worth um, biopsying and um, sending off a culture and sensitivity, which is done at very limited labs, but is really important because, you know, you sort of give it's a long time before you see a response to therapy often. So you might be like two weeks down the track and have progressive disease. Would you, how, how common is crypto in dogs? Not as common as cats. Excellent. Um, and does it tend to, um, it's not, I was going to say, does it tend to be worse or better? Um, but that's purely anecdotal and probably doesn't have anything anything to do with the way the infection behaves. It's just that dogs, we quite often see that it's involving the brain more than in cats. So say this dog on CT had um, involved extension from the nasal cavity into the frontal lobes. 
in the brain of its cryptogranuloma. Um, what would you be saying with prognosis? Um, sounds sounds not, not good. Poor prognosis, I think. <laughs> it's a silly question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so essentially CNS crypto is really bad news. And in fact, crypto in dogs tends to be really bad news in general. Um, uh, when it's in the CNS, your antifungals just don't penetrate quite as well. So we tend to have to use amphotericin and one, uh, antifungals that have more side effects than the fluconazole that we typically use. Um, so that would be the sort of big difference between cats and dogs, but then in cats, crypto can go into the um, brain as well and can, we have to use amphotericin in them as well. So um, that's not exclusive. All right, to say this dog had bilateral signs and violent sneezing and nasal signs, but no real congestion. So definitely discharge, but it wasn't actually stertorous on examination. What would your differentials be in that presentation? Some sort of uh, allergic rhinitis. Good. Anything else? Like a foreign body as well, if yeah. it's that violent and there's that, that much stimulation. Yeah. Um, nasal mite. Good, Max. That's what I was looking for. Bilateral discharge from foreign bodies would be extremely rare, I would have thought. Yeah, you're right. But not impossible. Never say never. Never, no. I had a dog who vomited a, um, I don't, I never found out what it was, but when I pulled it out, it looked like soft shell crab um, into the back of its nose. So it was spanning across both um, like nasal, caudal nasal cavities. It was in the caudal um, nasal pharynx. And so it had bilateral discharge. Um, excellent. So with bilateral, we're thinking probably more diffuse disease. So there's not, in dogs, there's not really very many viruses that will cause upper respiratory tract signs. Um, so there's not really any viral. Bacterial also very unlikely in dogs. Um, theoretically, we should still have fungal rhinitis on the list um, because of the degree of inflammation it causes and it can, can often be bilateral. Um, but otherwise, nasal mites <coughs> is the big infectious disease I wanted you guys to pick. How would you go about demonstrating the presence of nasal mites? I suppose the history of uh, using uh, antiparasitic medication, if, if they didn't use that, increased the chance of having nasal mites. Mm -hmm. yep. I think you can visualize it. Uh, yeah. I've never visualized it, but I look for it every time I do a rhinoscopy because it would be really exciting. Um, I don't think we've got many in Sydney. I've only ever heard of people seeing it in Canberra. Um, but you've never seen it. You've never seen it? Yeah, but Richard keep talking about oh, you look for nasal mites. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So I think Jodie Braddock saw one, and now ever since then, North Shore have been like, nasal mites, nasal mites. <laughs> Um, so how would you, in a dog where you didn't see any mites, um, but you wanted to just rule it out completely, how would you um, treat it? Respond, uh, ivermectin, I think it's three days, is it? Yeah. Um, or selamectin, so revolution works as well. Um, or probably like Simparica. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does, yeah. Yeah, so it's really easy to treat. So that's something that sometimes, particularly if people are a bit reluctant to go ahead with diagnostics, we just do a treatment trial and see what happens. But it's not going to be nasal mites. 
probably. Um, we're actually seeing heaps of allergic rhinitis and bronchitis at the moment. Um, are you seeing a run of them, Max? Mm, not more than usual. Not, not really, no. Interesting. Okay. Just wondering whether the weather that we've had, um, like a really wet summer, has just changed the pollens or, um, or something in our area. But, yeah, we're, we're getting a huge number of dogs. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But. Good. And then do you try and get tissue from a cat with crypto as well? Yeah. 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 I quite often, I give, you know, you give people options and in cats, because it's less likely to be invasive and more likely to be responsive to just fluconazole. That's one of my, one of my options is we just start treating when the LCAT comes back positive and we use LCAT yeah. and do no imaging. And because that's one of the options, most clients take it. Yeah. Um, so I find I'm much less likely to end up doing invasive disease in a cat, uh, invasive testing in a cat. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Are there any other infectious diseases of the upper respiratory tract you guys wanted to cover? Kennel cough? Pretty straightforward. What causes kennel cough? Canine cough, sorry. Um, is it like, it's like a multitude of factors. Yeah. So um, like viral factors. So it's, it's um, oh God, what was it? Um, like para-influenza virus, um, adenovirus and herpes. Good, very good. Herpes, I couldn't try to remember. Or Nutella. Yeah, and then secondary bacterial infections. Excellent. Um, there's a couple from overseas, like canine influenza, which we, we're very fortunate that we haven't had, but they've had sort of greyhound colonies wiped out by canine influenza in America. Um, so very rare cause of cough, but unlikely. Um, and then Bortella is the main one. And then there's like a strep um, zoophidemicus, which can cause it as well. I didn't know that. I was, I'm reading that off my notes. That it's so irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Um, but essentially most of the time, as you know, canine cough is self-limiting and you don't need to treat it specifically. Um, so the recommendation is to establish the cause if disease persists beyond seven days. So it's unlikely to be viral if it's persisting for longer than seven days. Or if it is viral, it's a weird virus that we should know what it is. Um, so the PC, respiratory PCR is the, the way to do that, apparently. Sorry, I'm not asking you any questions. Um, are there any indications for using antibiotics? Bordetella component? If you demonstrated it, so if you're kind of seven days in and starting to do PCRs and things. I think I would if it was a very a debilitated dog, immunocompromised, or it was pyrexic, systemically unwell. Yeah. Generally, I would avoid antibiotics. Yeah. Brachycephalic. My understanding is that Bordetella tends to live on the cilia and therefore is not particularly susceptible to systemic antibiotics. Is that correct? Um, I have heard that actually, but that's a really good point. You know, talking about doxycycline not getting into airfield. I mean, doxycycline getting into airfield spaces and other antibiotics not. Um, CLAV has pretty good penetration into the bronchial system. Um, so certainly the lower airways, amoxiclav is pretty good. And that would be my first choice for Bordetella or for, for canine cough complex, even if we don't have our diagnosis. Sorry, which one? Amoxiclav, amoxicillin clavulinate, clav. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure whether you meant um, doxycycline or clav. Oh, sorry, I did talk about doxycycline because both the doxycycline gets into airways really well. Um, clav gets in, it's, I think the, um, like if you measure the concentration of clav relative to serum, I think it's about 30%. So you, the MIC of the bacteria you're treating has to be sort of 30% of the serum level 
So if you were treating like a bloodborne infection with clab, for example, you'd be getting three times higher effect than you would treating a bronchial infection. So you just got to take that into account with dose, um, choosing a dose. Um, the, uh, so Bron mentioned treating with antibiotics in immunosuppressed or compromised patients. And also I'm going to throw in puppies. So if they're under eight weeks of age and they get canine cough, they're much more likely to get pneumonia and much more susceptible to the malnutrition effects and things. So um, clav for puppies is the recommendation from current veterinary therapy 15. All right. So that's probably about it for respiratory infectious diseases, upper respiratory infectious diseases. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask me or cases or anything? Um, can I ask about the LCAT? Is yeah. it very reliable? Like if it comes back negative, you can be like, yep, that's definitely negative. If it comes mm -hmm. back positive, you know, yeah. there's definitely some kind of LCAT going on. Yeah, it's really reliable actually. Um, so we, I think it's like 98% sensitivity and 99 or 100 specificity. Okay, cool. So very, um, very reliable test, very accurate test. Um, I've had one patient where it came back negative um, and it had a um, cryptococcal pleural effusion. And I can't explain why it came out negative because that's a very sort of systemic infection, you know, that should, I, it should have come back positive, but literally in all of my time of thinking, oh, this is probably crypto and probably a hundred cases. That's the only false negative I've had. And it was very easily diagnosed on cytology. So it was kind of no, no biggie. Cool. Um, and it never, we repeated that LCAT and it never came back positive. So I just, uh -huh. yeah, I don't know why. Cool. Thank you. No worries. Has anyone got any exam questions they wanted to debrief on? Nope. All right. I just recently got one kit that I don't actually know what to do. It's a uh, 22 weeks, so a purebred the kitten came to me because of uh, pre-fusion, uh, well, Disney uh, lethargic pre-fusion and was found and also pyrexia. So uh, Peggy drained the chest, like I think drained 55 mils of very thick straw uh, fluid that uh, I think the album goblin ratio is less than 0.4 and that same mess on the blood test. So we suspect that's a uh, feline infectious peritonitis. Yeah. <clears throat> the ultrasound, the abdomen was nothing. There's no like a granulomatous disease that I can actually do a biopsy. So I sent off those sample, like approved fluid to yeah. do uh, immunocytochemistry. Mm -hmm. It came back negative. <clears throat> I think everything comes suggestive of that. I just don't get a like confirmatory diagnosis. Um, have you done a coronavirus um, antibody test? Yes. Oh, on the on the fluid. No, I was actually thinking like if the cat has been exposed to coronavirus, like if the if the so if you did a serology test and the cat had never been exposed to coronavirus, it would de like it kind of takes FIP Maybe. off. Yeah. Right. I think um, I should do that. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it, then with the rest of your evidence, if you can then demonstrate this cat has had coronavirus at some point, I would probably just start treating. Mm. I was so surprised that both are over that medication rem. There's a via uh, two hundred eighty dollars for hundred milligram. Sorry, you were surprised at it. Yeah, the price is uh, it's reasonable. Yeah, yeah, it's it's doable. All of a sudden, like it's so nice to. You know, so often you're just saying, sorry, that's, you know, there's nothing to do. Um, but it's a really good, particularly with a plural effusion, like the stakes for this cat are quite high. And I just, probably the risk of F yeah, FIP, it's probably 95% FIP. The risk of the medication is quite low um, as far as turn causing side effects. And 
paying for the medication is probably going to be less expensive than readmitting and having to drain the pleural effusion another time. So, yeah, if we can get um, maybe even repeat the immunocytochem if you do have to drain the chest again, just to add evidence, but I would start treating this cat, I think, if it's positive antibody coronavirus. Thanks, yes. Yeah, no worries. I think I would do the coronavirus serology first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's not. Is, is the cat stable? Well, yesterday I have to drain it a second time and I drained uh, 85 mils out on a, like a 1.2 kilo cat. So that's a lot. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Is it really thick? Yeah, like stringy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, is it hospitalized or is it an outpatient? Yeah, it's hospitalized. Yeah. So, um, so and thought... yeah. So I'm hoping that I can order a drug like today, tomorrow. Yeah. Or today, yeah. yeah, order it. Yeah, I would just order it. Is it yeah, hospitalization must be adding up as well. Yeah. Um, have you got it on any specific anti-inflammatory medications or anything? Not yet, because I didn't get like any confirmatory diagnosis. So I didn't want to add on like steroid and non steroidal. Of course, yeah. yeah, Australian. Yeah. Um, yeah, I reckon you're on the money though. That's FIP. Yeah, it's quite disappointing that I can't get the ICC. <laughs> but apparently, like one out of four are like false negative. So, yeah. oh, I've, I've found FIP is one of my most frustrating. I don't think it's everybody's most frustrating, but I've ha taken cats to surgery with dry FIP for like biopsies of lymph nodes and blah blah blah. And you put this cat through a big surgery knowing what it's going to come back as. And knowing that they have a really short life expectancy, but the owners need an answer and you can't give them one without his so. And they've sort of, I, you know, you always feel like you're doing the wrong thing, but there's this like one or 2% chance that it's not FIP and you're pushing for that sort of thing. But yeah, that's a bit, it's a terrible disease. It is. But some, uh, there's people who've had coronavirus who were getting really similar, like, Pyogranulomas is inflammation and like vasculitis and stuff. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. They're getting FIP. <laughs> they seem to manage it much better in humans than we do in cats, though. All right. We will see you next Tuesday, I think, is Radiology Rounds Day. And then week after, I'll be back again. And we might skip. The rest of infectious disease or let's do a lower respiratory tract infectious disease day is that all right yeah it sounds great yeah um and then we will do um move on i think to um the next section of it and awesome cool. all right thank, thank you. you yeah thanks, thanks